got to tell me about it. <laughs> that took the hackers months to figure out how to do this. The poor and the underclass are growing. Racial justice and human rights are non-existent. They have created a repressive society, and we are their unwitting accomplices. Please understand, they are safe as long as they are not discovered. That is their primary method of survival. Keep us asleep, keep us selfish, keep us sedated. Welcome to another Bur Republic podcast. Today we've got a returning guest, Conscious Caracal. It's an honor to have him back again. Uh, we had him on a few months ago and we had an excellent discussion on what it meant to be Afrikaans, although many have varying opinions regarding that. I think we can all agree on today's topic, which is the media and the attention that has come to the South African stage. Whether you're local or international, there is much to be said about the current developments going on in South Africa all over the world. Conscious Caracal, thank you for joining us today. No, uh, thank you for having me back on. I thoroughly enjoyed our previous discussion and I'm looking forward to the one that lies ahead. At the same time, I do think this, well, while listening to what the, the topic for this discussion is going to be, I think it's a very necessary one. I think it's something that we need to discuss. Seeing as, uh, and I don't want to uh, be too too excited, but I want to say that our discussion right now is probably, we're talking about people, like I said in my video, people that are replacing the mainstream media and they, and they don't like it. They don't like it at all. For example, if you are working for News24 or CNN or whatever, you have to jump through so many hoops before you can publish a story. But we, as the alternative media, as citizen reporters, we can immediately publish a story. We don't have to go through all those corporate um, regulations or whatever. And that gives us the edge. So if I get some insider information about something that's happening in somewhere in South Africa, I can immediately post it and people can react on it and people can start discussing it. And I do think that's what gives us our advantage is the fact that we're just regular people. And uh, a, a common example I usually use is the YouTuber Sticks Hexenhammer. He makes videos where he literally sits there with like a leather jacket on, without an undershirt, with long hair. He looks like a hippie. But at the same time, it's very effective because he completely, he's completely the opposite of what you would get from, for example, CNN. Now, if you watch CNN, you'd probably get like this image of a guy sitting there, some guy in his 60s reading off a teleprompter in a suit, and it just looks fake. It doesn't look real. He doesn't look like a real person. He looks like a paid actor. But at the same time, if you get like a regular person like me or you guys or anyone like Willem Petzer or the Renegade Report just talking and being citizen reporters to the full extent, I think it very it, it resonates with the public. It makes you sound at least it gives you a lot more credibility. And it, it just proves you're a regular person. You're not some guy that's earning a six figure salary just to read off a teleprompter. You're just a regular person that's uh, passionate about giving the true facts to the people and to basically just give out information. You're not being paid. You're not being you're not captured. You're not being uh, an activist or you're not captured by some political party. You're just a regular person that has brought it upon himself to give out information that's true and that needs to be said. And I do think that really scares the mainstream media, the idea that here are people that are actually not just agreeing with us constantly, but actually challenging our views. And that's not that's unprecedented to an extent. And up until now, before the internet, you kind of only had to rely on the newspaper and what you heard on the TV or the radio to really know what's going on. But now, as I see on Twitter and on YouTube and a lot of other alternative media sites, is that suddenly now you can just subscribe to this regular normal person like Conscious Caracol or Boo Republic or whatever. They don't have the credentials of CNN or MSNBC or Sky News or whatever, but they're giving you facts and they're giving you their perspective, a fresh new perspective. That's not corporate or sterilized. It's more real. It's more, it's like listening to a real person. It's like you can now with the internet, you can speak to a normal person in South Africa. And that's, I think, uh, something that's a pretty big drawing power for me on Twitter as well, is that people are just looking for regular opinions. They want to talk to a normal person in South Africa. They don't want to listen to 
what CNN or News24, or whatever says what's happening in South Africa. They want to know from a regular South African, what is happening? Can you tell me more? Uh, is the media lying? Are they not? What's accurate? What is true? And I think we're doing a, a very big service to people, foreigners especially, in terms of just getting the truth out and getting a, giving them an alternative perspective that sometimes and even the majority of the time clashes with the mainstream media narrative. Yeah, the, the legacy media and the lying press uh, is, <laughs> in this day and age, seems to be a, a dying beast. You mentioned your example. What's effective about that is one of the latest videos you've done is it's literally just a picture of a caracal and you giving the scoop on what's going on, especially in the case of President Ramaphosa's uh, outright lie to the international media and uh, at the UN. You know, you can definitely see that there is a lack of authenticity in what we experience from the legacy media, from the lying press. So in that sense, the level of authenticity that we try and bring, we just normal people that want to make a difference and to help the situation rather than worsen it. Where that's concerned, you mentioned specifically in your current uh, videos and in a lot of your work lately on the, the current developments here in South Africa, and specifically that since we last spoke, a lot has happened. It's It's been a tumultuous time. We were on the way of getting ready to, um, even though everyone should be prepared for the worst when shit hits the fan, so to speak. Once the uh, situation very, very tense as we got closer to the uh, decision on what would happen with land expropriation. Then all of a sudden, something interesting happened. And that's that's a bit of an understatement, but we had the Trump tweet. So what has your perspective been on, on what the media has, has effectively done with the South Africa situation? Uh, do you think there's been fair coverage since then, since a lot of attention has been coming South Africa's way in the past month or so? See, that's the that's the interesting thing. Back in the day, for example, I, I joked in on Twitter today that uh, since when is Peter de Tuy, the second in command of News24, suddenly uh, Ramaphosa's PR manager? And that's the thing. Back in the day, you would have just, you would have heard that Ramaphosa said there's no uh, farm murders happening in South Africa. And you would have read about how News24 in general just clarify for you, okay, so this is what he actually meant. And that would have been your only source of information. That's it. You only have the paper, the radio, and the television. That's where you get your information from. But now suddenly, and that's where the internet puts in this, it provides this wild card almost. So now when News24 puts out their, their in quotation marks, clarifying piece on what act, what Ramposa actually meant, guys, don't worry. He's actually, he's quite reasonable. Bloke. Now some reply challenging that view that are saying, no, wait, wait a minute. You can't get away with this anymore. Like he was, not, he's not bad in English. His English is actually quite good. He didn't misspoke. He said exactly what he meant. And we don't buy it. We don't buy your lies. We don't buy what you're saying about what he actually meant. We of what he said exactly as he intended it to. And I think that's what the, the the situation that we're in right now is that people like me and you can now put out videos and counterpoints to what's being reported in the media. And I don't think the media are ready for it. They don't, they're not used to this, this scenario where they put out a view or an opinion and then you have people challenging it. I think that we're living in a very interesting time when it comes to that uh, type of information where Suddenly, you're living in a time where you don't have to be, a, if I can put it this way, a slave to the mainstream media's opinion and just parrot what they're saying. You can subscribe to Boo Republic or you can subscribe to Conscious Caracol. Or you can subscribe to Willem Petzer and you can get a bunch of different perspectives on what's happening in the world. And you can make up your own mind if you're a smart person. You don't have to just be limited to what's being said on News 24, or Times Live or The Citizen or whatever. You can actually cater your news intake to what you think is the truth. And you can get a myriad of different perspectives on what's happening. And I think that's actually informing the public. And that's what we're seeing right now in the world is that people are no longer just slaves to the mainstream media narrative. They are, they now have the tools and the sources to be able to effectively challenge the mainstream media narrative and make up their own minds. Yeah, I think there's, there's almost two things that has probably provided that that shift 
with the power I feel is is going more and more to the alternative media. And I think the legacy media and especially News 24 will look back and they will see that the time when it all changed was the day that they put off the comment section. The big the the difference from media what 50 years ago, 10 years ago is that you do not have that instant feedback to know what the reaction to the piece is. You don't know if your readers appreciate it, like it. You have to wait for a small little newsletter and 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 in the back pages to to read what everyone thinks. Where now, if we we bring out a piece, we bring out a video, we get instant feedback at the bottom, and we can respond personally to our own subscribers and answer personal questions. And it also gives you know subscribers that that feeling that they are interacting with the people with the content creators, which you never really had before. Obviously, Twitter also gives that, but as you said, sort of like a, a CNN anchor, and no one ever felt in a way connected or that they are actually communicating with that person because it's such a big sort of uh, company monopoly in a sense. Yeah, so I think those are the two big, Yeah, it's just a corporate machine. And so I think for me, those are the two big differences why people are shifting towards alternative media. One is that there is that personal connection. You, you, you can associate a lot more as if the person is more like yourself. And the fact that now you can, your view is uploaded in real time, which everyone else uh, can see and and it gives kind of a it's sort of like the stock market you can if you see like who's buying and selling you 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 have that idea of what direction people's mood are in what way it's moving to you've got a you've got a feel of sort of the psyche of the situation which now you get in real time all the time if you go on twitter on any subject you can you definitely have an idea of where the majority of people are, are heading towards where previously when you were just told a story or a fake narrative or propaganda, you really had no idea how everyone else felt about it or what the majority of people felt. And that's something interesting I noticed was a while back, I made a, a anti <laughs> a Marx Dupree tweet. And I said that I was taking him on about a point that he made. And Something I found interesting was I had some rebuttals there that said, why are you attacking him on Twitter? You should just write a letter to News24 and then they will publish it and then he will be able to respond. And I said, well, that's that's an outdated way of doing it. Why should I waste my time, hours of my time, to write a, a well-prepared letter, send it to News24 and then they just refuse to publish it? That's not how a debate works. Uh, Max Supriya can come on my show and he can debate me in real time. I'm not afraid. He can come talk to me, he can bring all his facts. I have absolutely no aversion to, to talking to anyone that I disagree with. I went on Ronaldo Jose's show as well, just to defend my views as well. I'm, I'm absolutely not in a position where I'm trying to uh, avoid debate. Uh, Max Dupree, Adrian Basson, Peter de Toy, any one of these oaks are more than welcome to come on my show and debate me live. And if the, And I mean, if they have all the facts on their side, would they have all the incentive to do it because they can effectively come on my show and humiliate me in front of my entire audience and that would be the end of me. But that's the thing. That's not how it works anymore. They refuse to debate. They don't want to come on your show or talk to you or even have a, a discussion. They'd rather still stick to the old way of, okay, no, you need to write a letter to News24 and maybe they'll they'll publish it. And then maybe, even if they publish it against all the odds, then you still have to hope that Max Dupree uh, responds to your letter. So, yeah, no, we're living in a an interesting time, exactly how you said, where there's this personal connection between people providing the news and their subscribers. For example, if I publish a story about something that's happening in South Africa and enough people message me on Twitter and say, no, what you said here is false, uh, here are the real facts, I will retract it. I am not an, an ideologue or a partisan. If people can prove to me that a story that I posted or made a video about is false or not real or fake news, I'm the bigger man. I will remove it and I will make an apology. I will say, okay, no, sorry, guys. I posted a fake and I posted fake information. I will retract it. And that's the thing is that we, we as the alternative media, we have the balls to say, come on our shows and debate us. We don't really mind. You can come chat to us. We're open to debate. 
But at the same time, we're not getting any takers. There's not anyone that's willing to come and talk to us from the other side. We're only really talking to our own people. And that's what I find really funny is that the, uh, to, to quote Willem Petzer, one of his favorite lines is what I, uh, I find it quite funny is that the, the left aren't really very eager to engage. They're really quite averse to the idea of actually talking to someone with different opinions because they know that we actually have facts on our side and we will humiliate them if they just come in uh, on a live debate. And that's just my personal opinion. I think we have facts and truth on our side and they would rather just stick to smear pieces and attacking our character rather than attacking the facts. So that's one of the reasons why I'm anonymous on Twitter. It's the main reason is not uh, because I fear what will happen, the repercussions I will face in real life. It's more of the idea of you judge my ideas on their merit, not on who I am. Who I am doesn't matter. Whether I'm black, white, or whatever, Afrikaans, uh, English, Kosa, whatever, it doesn't matter. My ideas matter. And that's the kind of idea. Of, well, that's what I, the, the, the central idea behind my whole Twitter of being anonymous is the idea of then you can only judge my ideas on their merit. Then you can't I, judge them on my identity. But at the same time, we don't see that from the left. They are so adamant on trying to reveal everyone's identity. They are the big supporters of no, everyone should post under, under their real name and house address and everything. I'm like, okay, sure. It must be nice uh, agreeing with the mainstream opinion. It must be nice having opinions that are on the side of the establishment. That must really be nice because that's not where I am. I'm, I have opinions that are not mainstream. I have opinions that are not agreed upon widely by all the woke crowd. And that's why also one of the reasons why I'm anonymous. There was this one story of this guy that said he just made a meme about Winnie Mandela and then the next, uh, uh, an, a distasteful meme about Winnie Mandela when she died. And then the next day, people showed up at his house with tires. So yeah, don't tell me that um, if, you, if you're if you a real man, you'll use your real name. Like, no, dude. Like, if my ideas are so bad, you can destroy them on their own. You don't have to know who I am. Yeah, we couldn't agree more. That, and I mean, this is an international trend. I mean, this is nothing new to this specific alternative sphere is the idea that the ideas should stand on their own. The ideas have their own merit. It is facts, not feelings, that's important here because we want to get to a certain truth. I think in the West, there's a huge emphasis on, on objectivity, on knowing what is true for everyone at least. I mean, that, that is one of the strengths of the Western sphere and that is partly why, one of the reasons maybe why the West is crumbling. South Africa might have been part of that at one stage, but... The that really makes one think is if our ideas are so bad and so evil, why must they literally take us off the internet to be able to shut us up? And by that specifically, I'm referring to last year after the Unite the Right rally in America, the Daily Stormer was, was the first website to be censored. And all they did was make fun of a woman for being fat enough to have a heart attack. Since then, there were many other figures that were taken off Twitter that were censored. Their ideas were not part of the status quo. They were taken down step by step. But alternative platforms came out as a, as a result of it, which is great because we need alt media. We need alternative platforms to be able to have those ideas spread. Now, this year, we had our favorite snake oil salesman taken off of Twitter and almost every other mainstream social media platform. The guy who calls out the globalists. And, um, you know, he... He was taken down too. And if we say his name here, this episode might get taken down too. So the, the point being is if our <laughs> ideas are that bad, why must we be censored? Like you say, deconstruct it. If it's such a shit idea and, and your ideas are better, your ideas are based on, on a factual objective reality, prove it. It's, it's as simple as that. So where that's concerned, you, I mean, the, we've got a huge uproar now about Sir Ramaphosa and Pharmatex, specifically him saying that there's no such thing as Pharmatex, there are no whites being persecuted in this country. Take us a bit more through that whole process. What what has recently come about where old Uncle Cyril is concerned? <laughs> well, that's the thing. I think this, uh, from my own personal opinion, I think this lie by Sir Ramaphosa is actually... A pretty it's to our benefit in terms of the people that are trying to bring attention to farm murders because it actually shows the type of disinformation 
that's going on in the mainstream media. And this is the point I made to Ronaldo Gauss when I was on his show. I said, well, he made the point that the people that are discrediting farm murders or saying that no farm murders are happening are just far leftists. They're not the mainstream. They're not regular people. And then I told him, well, no, Ronaldo. These are mainstream people. These are the heads of News24 and the, the heads of media companies in South Africa and major politicians. And now even, and this was after our, our chat, I actually wish it happened before our chat because it would have been a devastating point. Now it's the president of South Africa saying that there are no farm murders. And I always make the point that if people think that the problem of others exaggerating farm murders is propagandistic and bad, What's their view on people who try to convince the world that there isn't a problem at all, like our president, Cyril Ramaphosa? And that kind of puts them on the spot. The idea of, yes, it's bad to exaggerate the idea of farm murders. I don't think anyone is in, is in support of exaggerating the numbers. But at the same time, if you are against that, you should also be against people that are saying there's no farm murders at all. And these aren't far left fringe movements. This is the president of South Africa. <laughs> just, a, just a few months ago, his minister of police said that there were 62 farm murders that happened in the year 2016-17. I mean, come on, man. Like, this is lazy propaganda. Be better. <laughs> Yeah, it does. It does remind you a little bit uh, a few years back about about Zuma's fire pool, where he uh, attempted yeah. to show a video of how his extra Nkandla swimming pool is actually a fire pool. It um, it is something people from overseas must understand that that here, yeah, the propaganda is so badly done. It's basically like a a B rated mock horror movie and it's easy very easy to see it's through. almost you feel you feel almost ashamed for them like come on guys come on like give me a yeah. challenge like yeah, exactly. you can yeah, be yeah, you, i can write yeah. better scripts for you come on hire me <laughs> yeah you uh yeah it's it, it's a big embarrassment if we fail to take over the legacy media because it's technically <laughs> that that easy i mean uh, that's just like hearing you two guys speaking about you know, sort of the battle between the truth and facts. I think what we've seen the last few months, and which I think we all knew for a while, is that it is definitely power struggle. And that is what the left does. And, you know, even we use the left-right paradigm sort of here, but in essence, it's uh, it's basically us against communists. And, you know, basically, they've just shown that it is, they're never going to come on your show and debate you because they've got a lot to lose. They've got a lot of power to lose. Mm. And we've got everything to gain. And for... For them, it's 100% a power game and power starts with propaganda and manipulation. And then later it, it moves on to violence. So for me, it's, it's as we see them ramping up the pressure and uh, ramping up the lies when, when the lies become too blatant and everyone's laughing at them, then in the end, right. to violence. But I think we shouldn't be too surprised that, uh, they're not jumping on the web to come and I, I think the only thing that's going to ramp up is is the attacks uh, on our channels uh, naturally and that's why I always make the point that people need to realize there's a difference between a liberal and a leftist the liberals are individualists they are on our side they believe in free speech they believe in the individual they don't believe in collectivism or communism these aren't, aren't the people we should be fighting the people that are our enemies are the collectivists the leftists the actual people that sympathize with communism. And that's the point I made on Ronaldo's show is the, <laughs> it's actually quite amusing. The idea of I've never seen a social cause as vigorously and as passionately and as viciously opposed as the campaign to bring attention to farm murders. I mean, every decent person, if they read the stories and they, they just see what's happening to women and children. I mean, yes, dude, children being drowned in boiling water and women being raped and men being stabbed 150 times. I mean, you, you're probably a psychopath or drunk on ideology, as Aaron's Roots put it, if you ignore these facts and you say, oh, no, there's nothing wrong. This is just regular crime. It, it brings me to the point where I want to say no absolutely screw you go to hell if you behold those opinions if you read these stories if you talk to the victims of these crimes and you discredit them i can objectively say you are a terrible person i mean this should be in everyone's interest the idea of yes women and children are being raped and murdered 
and tortured due to the, and not uh, 100%, but largely due to the type of anti uh, farmer rhetoric that we're seeing in the mainstream media. I mean, I made this point to Ronaldo where I said, what would your reaction be if 80 journalists or 80 lawyers or 80 teachers were murdered and tortured in a calendar year? I mean, the international media, if it was journalists, the international media would label it a crisis and they would be demanding international intervention. But just because it's white farmers, people don't seem to care. And that's why I made the point that it it actually boggles my mind to see the amount of people on the left and just in the mainstream that try to discredit the campaign to bring attention to farm murders. Because, for example, I can speak for myself. I'm not paid by anyone. I'm not an, an Russian agent. I'm not a I'm not a propagandist. I'm just a regular person that knows people that have been victims of farm murders. And I, I come from a farming community. I know what it's like. I know the fear that these people live in. And I just realize that someone has to speak out against it. Someone has to bring attention to this issue. And then seeing people slander me, people like me or Willem Petzer or you or anyone that brings attention to farm murders tiring. it really makes it seems like the the forces of evil or malicious forces in the world are winning that they they've convinced themselves that they they are on the right side they're on the right side of history sometimes it makes me feel a bit hopeless I made a tweet the other day about this where some days I feel like the malicious forces in the world are winning feels like the the people fighting for truth and the people fighting for what's right are losing but then i see regular people just normal people still continue to fight even though they are being slandered by their fellow man and that gives me hope and that fuels my determination to continue a bit of the stigma should be taken away from collectivizing because fine you know as a group we can do so much more and we need individuals because if it's not for individuals the group can't progress whatever discoveries has happened in the west whatever technical advancements we might have had. I mean, the internet is here because of an individual. It's the same thing with anything in, in the West and within our communities is you need individualism. But at the same time, we shouldn't be too afraid of collectivizing. Specifically, maybe where that's concerned is the communal attention or the larger attention brought on farm attacks by so many people. You made of excellent points on the farm attack phenomenon and how it has been obscured in the media. If Anyone, including Uncle Cyril, decided to take the time. Uh, he's probably got some puppet uh, tweeting on his behalf. But the point being is, if you spend a minute on Twitter, you will find the latest farm attacks. You will find information that brings out as much information as possible in, unfortunately, as gruesome a detail as possible on what's happening. One good example is Ian Cameron of AfriForum. Just on the 26th of September, there was a farm attack uh, in the Steenbok Pan area in Limpopo province. Just that alone is, is enough to make you think. And, and his entire feed is full of these posts that say, listen, this is where the latest attack has been. Anyone can just follow the guy and see what's happened. He's even mentioned something that on his Twitter feed on the 27th of September, where Ian Cameron specifically specifically takes on Cyril Ramaphosa regarding his statement and says, provides evidence where he was sitting with a woman, a lady called Etricia Dutoy. She was shot through her jaw during a farm attack attempt. This is the third farm attack she survived. Her face had to be surgically reconstructed after the crime. The crime specifically that Ramaphosa says did not occur. So this is a phenomenon that is so widespread across the country that you can't deny its existence. At the same time, this is what's happening in the media. This is what Cyril Ramaphosa has done on an international stage. The one thing that I specifically want to bring in that really, you know, sort of gets the uh, tinfoil hat going, and we always make fun of the tinfoil hat on the show, but the point being is there is usually some <laughs> truth to it, is within that period where Cyril Ramaphosa made the statement that white farm attacks do not happen, we had Cyril Ramaphosa appearing on stage at a Council on Foreign Relations gathering where he specifically said, oh, but Trump is lying. There's nothing happening in South Africa. Guys, chill. It's OK. Then he does it again in front of the UN. At the same time, he does a photo opportunity with George Soros. And if you know anything about George Soros and the current migrant crisis in the EU, you know, 
there's definitely some sort of connection. And I've got this pet theory that South Africa was the canary in the coal mine for the greater Western sphere and definitely the model on which the current migrant crisis is based. And why I say that is when you look at George Soros's activities in connection to the ANC, when you see that before the referendum occurred or while the referendum was occurring here in South Africa and before we changed over to the Rainbow mm-hmm. Nation, the Open Society for, for Africa and South Africa or the Open Society for South Africa Africa took up residence in South Africa, sponsored by Soros. Africa Check, which everyone loves to quote, is sponsored by Soros. So this is again where that concept of where's the authenticity in the facts that we have when the facts are obscured by people that have billions of dollars invested in keeping you ignorant. So this is where it gets to spend some time on the internet, five minutes, and you will find the facts. And that is what the media wants to prevent. Okay, this is where I come back to that collective aspect. Do you, and maybe we've answered this question already, but does this mean that a collective effort of bringing attention to the issues here works? And when the three of us had this discussion or had a discussion last time, we were fairly blackballed and and we were fairly worried about what South Africa's future has in store for us. At the same time, so much has happened. We even said, you know, we must move, move, move to get as much attention on South Africa to shine a light on what's going on here. Maybe you can give us a bit more of an idea about that collective effort and that that effect of of bringing on more attention. Well, yeah, um, that's a very excellent question. It's the idea of And that's the question I get from a lot of people that follow me on Twitter or subscribe to me on YouTube. They just ask me, regular people, they ask me, what can I do to help? And the the only answer I always give them is just help us bring, help us shine a light on what's happening in South Africa. Help us get the story out. That's how you can help. And it's definitely helped. Yo, man, I can tell you now, since the, since the news broke about land expropriation without compensation, I've just seen so many people take to social media and say enough. I'm going to do my part now to bring attention to what's happening in South Africa and to help bring the truth and to help fight the misinformation we're seeing in the media. And I mean, uh, I don't want to overstate the effect we've had on the international community, but I do think our collective effort of constantly tweeting Americans and bringing attention to the subject led to Donald Trump making that tweet about South Africa. And a lot of people say, oh, no, it's the worst thing that could have happened for your cause, Donald Trump endorsing it. I'm like, I'm I'm in the complete opposite camp. I think it's the best thing that ever could have happened. Because now, one of the most powerful men in the world made a tweet about what's happening in South Africa, and now suddenly people are talking about it. Even though a lot of it is misinformation, there is a lot of it that is actual solid facts. And people correcting other people and saying, no, this is what's happening. I am in South Africa. I am a farmer. And this is how our situation currently is. And I think the best thing that could have happened to us was someone high profile as Donald Trump tweeting about it. Because that makes people talk about it. And Joe Rogan is another excellent example. I mean, he just mentioned on one of his podcasts, whenever I think about South Africa, I just hear about all these murders on farmers happening there. And he was absolutely attacked by people on the left telling him that he's a propagandist and he's talking about white genocide and he's a a, a far rightist and alt right or whatever. But no, he didn't say any of that. He just said, what I've been hearing about South Africa is about all these farm murders. And that's not something that's, it's not a lie. It's, and this is a, a, a point that I make that a lot of people disagree with me. Uh, I made this tweet, uh, made this point on Ronaldo Jose's channel as well, where I said, we can debate about the, the definition of genocide, but I'm not going to go as far as to say what's happening in South Africa is a white genocide. But just because white genocide, according to me, is a myth doesn't mean the farm is also a myth. The main focus should be to bring attention to what's happening in South Africa. It is. Not in terms of a, a white genocide, because when a when a foreigner hears white genocide or the word genocide, they immediately think about people being rounded up into camps and being selectively exterminated, and that's what's not what's happening in South Africa. So then, when they dig into the facts and they see that's not that's not what's happening, then they just instantly discredit the the cause. So I'm not personally a proponent of uh, white genocide or talking about or using that term for what's happening in South Africa. I'd rather just bring attention to the farmer epidemic 
and also land grabs and the idea of racially based land theft that's going to happen in South Africa. I think that's more pressing, more true to the facts and more accurate than uh, labeling it a genocide. But a lot of people disagree with me and I'm open to debate them about that fact. But I just think from a from just looking at what's happening in South Africa, I think labeling it a genocide is a bit sensationalist and um, actually does damage to the courts. But you might disagree. Yeah, I think well, for me, the, the, the battle about definitions is what the, the mainstream media and the left generally uses as a major distraction. It, it is mm. it is just a tool for them to, to get us fighting amongst each other and maybe causing a bit of division in a, in a sense. For me, whether, whether we call it a genocide or not, for me, it absolutely does not change anything that we're going to do that to improve the situation, to bring the information out. I, I, I don't think, again, the question is whether that does that kind of get the get the get the ball rolling with regards to say UN intervention and all of these you know does that definition need to take place for some legal ramification for um, for the for the international community to to intervene I don't know and I, and I don't really care because I, I do sense we're gonna have to solve this problem internally anyway and um, I mean you could just see every time someone like Adam Sudis goes onto the mainstream media it, it becomes they just throw words at him um, you know, especially the, the, the genocide, the, the, they, they use apartheid, they use racism, they use these, these words which have changed meaning so often and is used to, to obfuscate the actual point and, and, and the actual facts. And I do think that, and we waste a lot of precious time in, in fighting about uh, these definitions, which you know, makes absolutely, absolutely no difference. I would like to kind of give your opinion because I'm, I'm a bit kind of on, 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 on the fence here with regards to how much should we focus on the, on getting the news out in the international media and, and especially also the, the, the Trump tweet. I'm definitely for the more people know, the better in a sense. But what would you see as the most ideal way for not just America, but any international community intervening in a way to to kind of put a halt to this to these to these farm murders is it in a way of sort of a trade war um, or as we see russia where they've actually asked some of the farmers to to come and farm in russia in a way that is kind of bad for south africa as they're losing their their major food production how do you hmm. see in an ideal way this reach to the to the international community how would that benefit and in what ways would that benefit us if you if if, hmm. if you don't want to touch a crystal ball there for a second Right. So that's, I mean, yo, dude, that is the main question. That is what everyone is asking. How can we solve the problem? What is the best way to approach it? What are we trying to achieve by bringing attention to this matter? And I think, according to my own opinion, I think uh, government intervention necessarily isn't the best scenario. I think rather, well, to an extent, yes, it's government intervention, but I do think what we need and what I think will do a lot of good for the farm murder or to stop the farm murder epidemic is to just start. That's how apartheid ended is that you can just get the international community to put pressure on South Africa to acknowledge firstly, I mean, our president can't even do it, acknowledge that we have a problem. Yes, farm murders are real. Farmers are being killed at a rate far higher than even South African policemen. Can we at least agree on that? And then, secondly, we don't want government intervention in the extent of that the government needs to be in charge, well, according to me, uh, be in charge of farm security. I think what needs to happen is that the government needs to give farmers more room and more capacity to defend themselves. For example, unban the commandos, give the farmers enough room that they can organize on their own to ensure their own safety, bring back the commandos, make sure that farmers can defend themselves, bring in, for example, something I'm a big fan of is the stand your ground laws in America, where if they can just give an exception to farmers that if you live on a farm isolated away, far away from police, you have the right, if someone comes into your home that you didn't invite or that you don't know, you have the right to stand your ground. You're not legally ob obligated to retreat. I think that'll already make a huge difference. 
and at the same time just put pressure on south africa that's how that's how apartheid ended just put pressure on the south african government to actually acknowledge that we have a problem that's the, that's the thing about the anc that since 1994 the anc have not really been criticized by the world they've always been the darlings of the media and the the media outlets of the foreign countries they've always been the the progressive force for peace and progress and whatever and reconciliation but at the same time i think they need to be scrutinized more i think the international community should actually walk up to them and say hey there's a genuine issue and a genuine crisis happening in your country farmers are being murdered at a rate that's unacceptable and you need to do something about it at least give the farmers the capacity to defend themselves tell them that they have the right to stand their ground and not legally obligated to retreat and give them back their right to defend themselves in terms of uh, collectivizing in terms of creating commandos and patrols and it doesn't even have to take government resources i mean if you look at the stats since 1994 there's been 450 political assassinations in south africa and political assassinations have been labeled a priority crime in south africa but since 2011 or 2012 there's already been the exact same amount of farm killings but farm murders aren't a priority crime so I think the first step, and that's what I'm actually quite positive about when I, after my chat with Ronaldo Gos, he actually agrees with me that farm murders need to be a priority crime. And I think that's the first step. Is the It's almost like going to a, a AA meeting. And the first step to recovery is admitting that you have a problem. And I think that's what Africa needs. We need to be able to be big enough to admit, yes, farm murders are a problem. It's not a partisan issue. It's not left versus right. People are dying. Children are being tortured. And we need to do something about it. And that's what I think the first step is, is that the government needs to label farm murder as a priority crime. And then secondly, they need to, because it's a priority crime, they need to give farmers or farming communities the capacity or extra capacity to be able to defend themselves and to be able to stand their ground and to be able to manage their own security. The government don't even have to pour funds into securing uh, into rural security they just need to give farmers the freedom to be able to defend themselves i think that's the the main way that we can solve this issue and it starts with pressure from the international community and pressure from the international community comes from us people like me people like you people like willem petzer bringing attention to the issue and actually making the international mun community understand the gravity of the situation that we're facing mentioning the firearms thing there's this meme that uh, i find quite enjoyable and it definitely makes you think essentially the meme starts with god created man and then samuel colt made them all equal in reference to the fact that he made manufacturing of the revolver a possibility which means more access to firearms self-defense things like that and then as it goes further to say, but uh, Cody Wilson made men even more equal because now you can print it, print a firearm in your house. Like it has become that easy to have self-defense. At the same time, we've got this issue where defense security is a huge, huge industry in this country. And it's because we handed over our own power where it comes to self-defense, where it comes to, where it comes to our protection. We've handed over that to other entities to protect who obviously don't have our, have our interests in mind. I mean, just look at the insurmountable laws or the, the variety of laws in place just to prevent the average citizen from protecting himself with a firearm, legally, of course. Now, the criminal doesn't go through all those procedures. He just does what he wants. He gets a gun, often from the police, and he goes and robs. So, you know, where, where we stand on what defense entails. I think that's, like you say, it's a valid point. I think we should be able to, at least if you don't want to help us with the issues in this country, uh, and I'm referring now to the state or whatever, if you don't want to acknowledge a problem or if you don't want to help, at least lift those laws so that we can look after ourselves. But I mean, the moment that happens, then their system starts crumbling, the power, the power dynamic shifts and the illusion that they have control falls away so that that's something to consider regarding farm attacks and the the whole issues regarding 
what people have experienced. You, when we last spoke, you attended the Kill the Boer book launch. And you had, and, and this is now your, your privilege, <laughs> but you sat and you were able to listen to some first-hand testimonies regarding farm attacks where you were meters away from those who recount their stories, recount their experiences. What was that like for you? Well, uh, that's a, that's an excellent question. It's okay. Full cards on the table. I'm not a very emotional person. It takes a lot to get me emotional. I'm, I'm not a, a very emotive person, but at the same time, yo, man, sitting there in that crowd and listening to the stories of people telling their victims of farm attacks, just giving their stories and telling us what happened to them. It made my skin crawl. There was a, there was a point in, in the, in the, the book launch where I wanted to walk out of the room. I was feeling nauseous. I didn't want to listen anymore. I genuinely wanted to just get out of there. I didn't want to listen anymore. It was just too gruesome. It was too disgusting. And, but then I had this thought that just because they are, they are telling these stories, but it's, you're not there experiencing, experiencing this. If you are this traumatized just by a story, and I'm talking to myself, how must it feel for that person to have gone through that experience themselves? And I can't bring myself to even imagine what it feels like. And then you have someone like Sora Ramaphosa, the president of South Africa, going to an international forum and saying that these four murders are not happening. And it, it breaks my heart. My heart bleeds for the families that have, and the friends of people that have been murdered, that have been tortured, that have been killed in farm attacks. And it's, man, it's, <laughs> yo, man, it, yeah, it's, it's beyond belief. It, I can't even bring myself to put myself in the shoes of those people. Like there was this one woman at the book launch that told, told her story where, she, her husband, and her, her, I think her child was like 10 years old, had a daughter of 10 years old. They was, they were sitting in the, they were watching a movie or something. And then these two men broke into their house and they start threatening them with weapons and telling them, point us to the safe and we're going to kill you whenever. And they shoot the husband and, well, he's not dead yet. He's just wounded and he's lying there. And they're asking them, where's the safe? Where's the safe? And they, and uh, they're asking for all types of uh, other implements. And the woman knows that these implements are going to be used to torture us. And then this 10 year old girl and this, I've, I've never heard a story like this where it, it touched my heart. Just hearing this type of experience that someone had a real person had this experience where this little girl walks up to these attackers and she brings her little piggy bank with like little cents and two rands and five rands in it. And she tells them, you can have all of this. Just leave us alone. This is what you want here. You can have all my savings. You can have all my money. Just leave us alone. And then as they approach her, her father gets up and he walks up to these attackers and he just, and he's wounded already. He shot through the chest and he just pleads with them. And he just asks, please, please don't kill my wife and my child. And then the other attacker just looks to his friend and he says, just shoot him, brother. And they shoot him through the head in front of his child and in front of his wife. And they, after they did, did that, they walk out of the house. They didn't take anything. And that was it. And they left that child and that, that, and that woman just sitting there. And they didn't take anything. They were just there to be cruel, to kill him, to be monsters. And that it, <laughs> It brought me to a point, like I said, where I wanted to walk out of that room. I didn't want to listen to any of more of these stories. I, I had enough. I was feeling sick in my stomach. I was bleak. I was feeling absolutely disgusted. And then I realized, oh shit, this was just one story. Every week in South Africa, we have one farm murder on average. We have at least three farm attacks every week. What are these people going through? I can't even sit there and listen to one story. I feel that actually experienced this. I, I, 
I can't even put myself in, into the shoes of those people. And I think that was the main point of the, the whole book launch was having, yo, and I have an immense respect for this woman that she could stand there in front of this crowd of a hundred people and actually tell her story without breaking down. And it just made me realize again that we're on the right side of history. We are on the side of the truth. We are on the, on the side of what's right. And if you want to tell me that these people, these innocent people that are just telling their stories are right-wing conspiracy theorists and people like me, people like you, people like Willem Petzer, people like Aaron Rutz, that want to bring attention to these horrific crimes are just far-right propagandists, I can tell you right now you can go to hell because they are innocent people that are being murdered in South Africa. And these people that are bringing attention to them, I have immense respect for the people that are bringing attention to farm murders because they are being slandered in the media. They are being downplayed. They are being called propagandists. They're being called fascists. They're being called Nazis. They're being called white supremacists. And being able to bring attention to this cause while still being slandered like that takes a lot of balls. And that's why I can't even express how much respect I have for people like Adam Zeruts that are putting themselves out there to stand up for what is right. And my only message to them is that please keep keep doing what you're doing because you're inspiring thousands of people. Yeah, th that was the story of uh, Mariandra Yenis, right? The the lady who, who got attacked. The Particularly right. Yeah, um, it, I can't confirm it. Uh, okay, but yeah, if I'm not mistaken, that that might have been her story. She actually, Mariandra Yenis, also spoke at the recent, uh, at the the, um, the the memorial to farm victims where they placed the cross, all the crosses and that. Uh, she also had a speech there mm -hmm. where she spoke about her experience and that she was finally able to lay her husband's cross uh, on this hill with many other or crosses related to victims of, of farm murders and and often it's not just the one person who has been killed it's a family that's been broken it's a farm that's been disrupted it's been a part of the economy that's been disrupted wholeheartedly so i can only imagine what she must have gone through what many others have gone through and just you recounting that to us it, it's it's phenomenal that someone can deny the existence of this no, even though and if you say that you're 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 not an emotional person, you definitely have a way to evoke emotions in, in <laughs> others. And my feeling about these things, it is it is in a way a ploy of of the left and the media in a way that because as you as you recounted, it it is so insanely gruesome and evil that I think your brain automatically tries to dissociate from it because you don't actually want to. You don't you don't have the ability to think that you can live in a world where that can happen tonight which you know even just for us who don't just live on a farm it, it can happen it happens to well everyone in this country not everyone obviously but there's there's a high percentage uh in in relation to other sort of first world countries but it i think it's a definite tactic for them to outright deny it as Cyril Ramaphosa did that outright denial has that effect on your brain to say like, yeah, it's not happening because it's such an easier thing to think. It's easier thing to think it's not happening than actually face the reality because facing that reality that this is happening to people is, is, it's very, I think it's very difficult to handle. It's a very difficult reality to go to bed to every night and think that, you know, you, you have to do something about it. There's, there's no way that you can go and enjoy the rugby on Sunday or Saturday and go play a golf game when, people are going through this so uh no that was a very emotive way of retelling that story and that's the thing that i also got because you you want further correspondence about what happened at that book launch just the something that struck me was the absolute silence of the people in the room just listening to the stories about what's happening uh about what's the the key what's the the main reason for Aaron's taking three years of his life to write this book that's based on over a thousand sources. He's not even, and this is the, the big thing, he's not even getting any of the profits from the book being sold. He's, uh, all the profits go to, to charities for farm murders. And it is absolutely astounding that someone takes three years out of their life to write a book 
based on a thousand more than a thousand sources and not even taking any credit or not taking any profits from it it's not and that's why a lot of people like to construe his cause and say oh adam Sarutz is just making money off uh, the graves of people being murdered like no he's not making a cent from it he's doing it because he actually believes in the cause and that's why that's the thing that i got from his speech in parliament as well just seeing all everyone in that room attack him and slander him and paint him as this racist evil person the next day i joined afriforum and i took a screenshot of the confirmation that said okay welcome uh, welcome to AfriForum. Uh, thank you for your contribution. And now I'm a member of AfriForum because of what he said in Parliament. And then I actually started a little mini Twitter trend because then a, about a dozen people also did the same. They also uh, joined AfriForum and posted their screenshots. And AfriForum now this this month have a record number or oh, uh, uh, exceptional number of new members to their to their organization. And I do think as long regular people are willing to stand up for its rights and people will fund people like AfriForum that are standing up for property rights and for justice in this country. And I do think anyone listening right now, I can implore you, please support AfriForum, support, support people like Adam Sarutz because they're doing what a lot of people in this country are too afraid to do and too afraid to say. No, we couldn't agree with you more. And the more people speak out, the less there is a stigma around the situation here in South Africa, the less people can deny it and that uh, tipping point can occur. And it, it's definitely thanks to uh, people like Aaron Strutz who had the opportunity to speak with Tucker Carlson all the way in the US. Um, and as we are currently speaking, I think Lindiwe Sisulu is sitting with uh, Secretary Pompeo from uh, the US discussing the situation in South Africa. And I don't even know if that's a good move, <laughs> purely because Lindiwe Sisulu is the foreign minister of South Africa, but she's still a representative of the ANC. So I don't know how well that would help us. I think uh, we should just keep on pushing until, we, until that Overton window shifts properly or even further. Um, as we wind down and not to end on an entirely somber note, but we wanted to get your thoughts on where you see the country going, considering how things change so quickly. Uh, is there anything that you can possibly see on the horizon for us? Not taking into account the rise of uh, China within South Africa. Uh, I mean, that's a whole topic on its own, but where do you see things heading in the next few months? That's a, that's a very hard question. Uh, I think that's the question that a lot of people are asking themselves is where are we going to end up? And at the same time, I can tell you now, well, firstly, the ANC are going to win the next election. That's pretty much a given. But something that d does really disappoint me in the South African political sphere is that we don't really have a serious opposition. I mean, the DA, they claim to be the official opposition, but they flip flop so much on their, their policies and where they're going that they can't really anyone nobody can really take them them seriously so my prediction for the next i don't know how long you you want this this time frame to be but i do think the immediate future i think the the come the election coming up is actually to the detriment of south africa because the you have to understand cyril's mission is to keep the anc together but also to kind of fix the mess that south africa is in and he can't really fix that mess by uh, making a bunch of heads roll and to make some drastic changes just before an election, because that would compromise the ANC's unity. But at the same time, I see South Africa not, I don't think we will go the, the way of Zimbabwe or Venezuela anytime soon. I think we have enough people in this country that care about this country, that want to see it persevere, that want to see it actually uh, last through the storm to make it at least bearable to stay in South Africa. I don't think we're going to, you know, like I said, we're not going to go the way of Zimbabwe or, or Venezuela just yet. I think we still have a little bit of a chance if we just play our cards right. And I think we have, we're in a situation right now where the environment in South Africa is ripe for an opposition party that actually stands up for their principles. And I'm actually quite hopeful with this new alliance between COPE and AfriForum 
And I do think uh, this COPE AFRI Forum Alliance should try and uh, make a further alliance with the IFP, which is also gaining ground in KZN. And if that's possible, if we can create an opposition party that not doesn't really stand a, stand a chance in the, the upcoming election, but maybe in a future election, we can supplant the DA, which is a weak opposition party, with an actual strong opposition party. And my prediction for the, and it might be a bit out there, but it's just the uh, off the top of my head, which I think what's going to happen in the immediate future, well, maybe in the future, it's not, maybe not immediate future, is that the ANC and the DA are so similar that they are going to merge and become the DANC. And then the EFF, uh, Kusatu and the South African Communist Party are going to break away from the ANC and they're going to join the EFF and they're going to become the, the leftist wing of, AN, of South African politics. And we are... And this is a pretty hopeful prediction. I hope this happens because then we will have a center left party, the, the DANC and the far left party, the EFF, South African Communist Party and Kusatu. And I think the closer we can move to a, a, a dual uh, political s situation as we have in the as we see in the United States. I think that will actually be to the benefit of South Africa, that we can see some genuine competition in our electoral system. But yeah, now then you also have on the other side, you have people like Willem Petzer that see the, the country collapsing like Venezuela or Zimbabwe. But then also he sees some positive in it. He says from, you can't go lower than rock bottom. And rock bottom is where you actually have a solid foundation to build a new future on. And maybe he's right. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, I might be a bit naive and believe that we can still make South Africa work. I don't think secession or um, a Boer Republic, if you will, is that pragmatic or anything that's too realistic. But let's see what happens. At the moment, I can't really give you a solid prediction. At the moment, I'm just along for the ride. I can't get off this roller coaster. I'm strapped in solidly. But at least I'm strapped in with a few other million people and we're going to see what happens. And I think it's very interesting times that we're living in, especially me, someone that's absolutely obsessed with pol politics. It's I, I get so much joy just from analyzing what's happening and trying and just trying my best to predict what's going to happen. That's why this is such a hard question, because I don't really have a solid answer in terms of what I think is going to happen. I can only speculate. What do you think is going to happen? It might be completely different from what I'm predicting, but I want to hear from you. What do you think, as you can both answer in your own capacity, what do you think? Where are we going and where are we going to end up in the near future? Well, firstly, we'd, we'd like to thank you for probably the most in-depth crystal ball the political analysis we've <laughs> ever had. I think bets are rolling in already to see whether, <laughs> whether you are correct. And I don't even like listening to politics, but listening to that was, was pretty impressive. Uh, well, I, I predict the, the most obvious thing is that BLF is going to win and they're going to divide the land between themselves and a few Khoisan. And uh, we're going to create a little small Elysium somewhere there uh, in Robben Island. That's uh, definitely what I see happening. I think you missed it completely. <laughs> no, no, on a serious note. <laughs> yeah, I, and, and I, I'm definitely probably a bit more somber. I think next year will be chaos in the sense that uh, everyone's going to try and show face uh, i think it's going to go the same way anc is going to win and yes uh, da won't uh, make a lot of ground i don't i think with with the even with the cope and uh, free forum alliance i think they just serve such a small part of the south african demographic that i, I don't think there's any way that they're going to even beat the eff in a sense but i do also see as you said i do i do see a few political groups uh, amalgamating and, and coming together to try and strengthen their vote. Uh, economically, I, I, you know, it's, it's, I actually, I foresee and I hope actually uh, a semi-collapse in a sense that we're seeing around the, the world with sort of currencies like uh, in Argentina and Turkey and Venezuela. I see a, but I see a big reduction in the value of the rand and i see that as a big opportunity for this for the, sort of the transfer of wealth that'll that'll occur with regards to uh, cryptocurrencies i think there's going to be a bit of a, a spike next year and that'll make a lot of people wealthy and give a lot of opportunity for parts of south africa to to improve where you know whether i think sort of a succession happens in a way i would like that uh, i think that might 
not happen next year, definitely not next year, but maybe the next five years. So, but yeah, just I'm happy to hear that you're strapped in and that, that obviously says that you're going to give the best possible political analysis that you can. And uh, we're glad to hear that Conscious Caracol is still going to be reporting on South African politics for the next couple of years. No lies. I am, I've got my backup plan to, uh, to watch the show from afar with popcorn, but I am definitely going to fight to the last zombie is killed or <laughs> that, I can, that I can end off. So that's my take. Yeah, you see, the thing is, uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, the alliance between AfriForum and COPE, that there's this potential future where we see cooperation between multiple parties, multiple ethnicities, uh, because after all, we are stuck on the same boat, whether we like it or not. So yes, that, that factors in, and I think that is a viable solution, although I am distrustful personally of anyone with a prior history to the ANC. That being said, we've personally had the opportunity to quickly interview Musiwa Patrick Lakota for a few minutes. I mean, the guy's a busy guy, but we still luckily had the opportunity to speak with him and he was quite genuine. And in that process, he was harassed by the EFF. And I think anyone any day that you're attacked by communists is a good day. And anyone who is attacked by communists, we can at least uh, have some faith in, although I think one should be cautious. Uh, so yes, we, we were lucky to speak with him. He does seem genuine. We were also lucky enough to speak to Jeremy Cronin, a representative of the ANC and a representative of the South African Communist Party. And that guy's scaly. I, I just, I can't trust him at all. The way he speaks, the way he uh, describes the situation and he's one of the guys behind the land reform process, behind the expropriation process. So he's definitely, especially in the way that we asked him a question or two, he, was, he wasn't very open about what he actually was doing. So where political parties are concerned, I think yeah, we're in for a rough time. I'm also strapped into the seat. I am on this roller coaster uh, and I'll do whatever I can to spread awareness to bring as much attention on the issue as possible. I mean, that's why we're doing this after all. We're not interested in ego. We're interested in ideas and facts. We've personally seen that facts can help turn the situation. That's partly why we're doing this uh, podcast with you, is to look back at the time between our chats and see what's happened. And specifically, a huge amount of changes happened. I don't think any, all, any of us thought that it would happen so quickly. I mean, it, it did seem like there were dark days. There are definitely still dark days ahead, but there's more light on this roller coaster, if I can put it that way. Political party wise, I'm not a big fan of political parties, uh, specifically parties that, I mean, there, there's very little maybe pro white political representation. And for obvious reasons, the, the, the whole deck is stacked against us. Uh, we are a minority. We are threatened in this country, even though we are the tax cows, even though we essentially pay for everything. So I think there should be a fourth political theory that should come about. I think there should be uh, an alternative to this stuff. And even though I've, I've been keeping track of what's been happening overseas, uh, what, what is considered far right movements and, an extremist has become, and if one actually looks into it, if you actually take the time, the same with the farm owners, if you take the time to look into the facts regarding all the political parties in the country, as well as the trends and things that are happening overseas, you soon realize that the issues are far more nuanced than, than they made out to be. And that's also why we're looking at the issues with the press. At the same time, I think there needs to be an alternative political theory. If it's revolved around self-determination, I'm all for it. Like you say, it's it's maybe a bit too pragmatic to think that we'll have the next uh, Buddha Republic or the next ethno state coming out or the next self-deterministic sanctuary in this country. And I think it should be something we should work toward. The, the might, might we just say that all our all our subscribers will have a discount on their passport prices? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then we'll, we'll we'll chuck in a free T-shirt once they sign up. Uh, but uh, jokes <laughs> aside, I think we I think that's something that we need to look at is is an alternative. What was nice about our interview with Karl Bosov from Iranist, he specifically mentioned that it's not a question of left or right or this political party or that political party. Rania was simply an alternative. And that alternative has proven to be a very efficient, a very safe, 
a very cohesive uh, alternative for a subset of Africa of the Africana population. And I think we should strive for something like that, where we have control over our economy, where we have control over our own labor force and over our currency. And yes, this is where the cryptocurrency thing comes in. This is where we should help each other out, you know, a broad-based white economic empowerment or something like that. But where the country's going, I honestly can't say. I mean, if you look at how quickly things uh, develop, how quickly things change, it's in a matter of hours, all of a sudden you've got uh, chaos erupting in the country because someone, uh, someone, well, the leader of the supposedly free world has stated simply, oh, guys, look over there. There's something fishy going on. And he did that with Sweden a year ago. And the media sort of fell into a trap. And it's the same with our But situation. he was right. He was dead <laughs> on right. I mean, if, you, if anyone takes the time to look at what's happening overseas, that's the situation. If anyone takes the time to look at the situation in South Africa, and this is again where facts come into play. It's not feelings. It's not. And this is part of the attack on Aaron Roots in Parliament. Facts, not feelings, will determine what is correct. I think that I, I, I personally have hopes where that's concerned. As we, as long as we continue with this, as long as we keep on bringing attention, I think we will have a future ahead of us. That being said, you are right. There is an element of truth to the fact that, you know, you can't go further than rock bottom. I hope that it's not that late that people wake up to the issues in the country. But I think we are very slow to taking action. I think we are very slow to waking up and It'll, the, the inevitable might happen where you've got the zombie hordes coming down and uh, trying to... T- oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I <laughs> think they, that there will be an event that would wake our people up and I hope it won't be mm. something that's too late, if it's not too late already, yeah, to be honest. And, uh, succinctly expressed your, your opinion. I think I agree with a lot of it. And I just want to thank you again for bringing me on for a second time. I'm very impressed with the the channel growth you've achieved in the past few months. So seeing the the progress you've made from, I mean, I I subscribed to you when you had like 31 subscribers. <laughs> yeah, like two. <laughs> and seeing the progress you've made <laughs> since then, I'm I'm really proud of you guys. Like, really, you're you're doing an excellent job, and I'll keep promoting your podcast. You have some very interesting guests on, uh, maybe some unorthodox guests, just people from Twitter that by the mainstream media standards aren't really their opinion doesn't carry much weight but at the same time you're willing to talk to them they might have something interesting to say and what do you know maybe they maybe they become an influential figure in the future so that's why i'm saying it's just uh, i mean the last time i was on your podcast i had i think 500 subscribers and now i'm at 1600 so yeah uh, thank you for having me on for a second time i thoroughly enjoyed this chat and i look forward to coming on in the future and giving you some more uh, retrospective views on what's happened between now and then hopefully it's a bunch of positive news if anyone wants to reach me, they can just search Conscious Caracol in on YouTube or on Twitter. There will probably be a link to my channel on my Twitter in the description. Uh, thank you all for listening and thank you for the Blue Republic podcast for taking the initiative to just get the message out there, give some alternative, some alternative perspectives uh, that you're not going to get from the mainstream media. And I think that's the theme of this whole podcast is the idea of we are the the counterculture. We are giving alternative perspectives that you are not getting from corporate media. And people appreciate that. I can see it from the feedback I get every time I upload a video. And it's immensely supportive. It's uh, incredibly encouraging. And that's why I keep doing what I'm doing. And that's why you should keep doing what you're doing. And I will keep supporting you as, or future pro- projects you pursue. Keep doing what you're doing. Uh, thank you again for having me on and uh, cheers everyone have a good one thanks for coming on Caracol we really appreciate it we look forward to next time I'd like to include an afterthought on today's podcast Caracol made a point regarding the guests that we invite and those who reach out to us we aim to provide a platform to voices that would otherwise have no opportunity to speak out collectively we are under constant assault in the media both print and visual, on social media, in public, and worst of all, in our own homes. There are many more out there who want to be heard, who have stories to share, 
reach out to us. Please, we want to hear from you. And this is a heartfelt invitation. Yes, we might be unorthodox, but that's what makes us different. We aim to have a sanctuary in the long run, where we can have a future, where we can see our children grow up free and safe. It starts here on online forums, on the mainstream web. And as we get attacked for our ideas, we'll create alternatives. We will bring the business, the interest to the intellectual dark web if we have to. This is the same for in real life spaces. Our money talks. Our presence matters in this country. If we can get together to make spur restaurants think their approach, if we can boycott Sassel and the anti-white banks, if we can call out our unelected president, because face it, he belongs to the Oppenheimers, on statements that negate our existence, we can make their deep and corrupt pockets feel our absence. You have an opinion. If you are comfortable sharing it with us, please get into contact. We do try to get to everyone as much as possible and as soon as we can. We are here to effect change together. We have multiple plans and projects in the works. As they are released, we will uh, announce them, so please keep an eye out for that. Thank you for taking the time to listen to another Bur Republic podcast. Please like, share and subscribe to our channel. And if this message resonates with you, please spread it as far as you can. Your support is appreciated. We also welcome cryptocurrency donations and any support we receive in that regard goes to improving our content, as well as enabling us to do more documentary and investigation style videos. The addresses can be found in the description below. Any feedback is encouraged and we look forward to engaging with you on our various social media platforms. You can find us on a variety of social platforms and you can find those links below. Included is our email address, which you can use to contact us. We update as regularly as we can. So please follow and reach out to us. Until next time, stay safe wherever you may find yourself.